My Vintage Love. Today I am so excited to bring you part one of my 1940s makeup tutorial. For this part, I'm gonna be focusing on a more natural look, a look that from the home front and the military woman would have been wearing. So we're not gonna go super far into the Hollywood glamour aspect of things. We're just gonna keep it real for this one. But please stay tuned because we're gonna be posting another video showing a more Hollywood glamour aspect of things right after this one, part two. And thank you so much to my beautiful friend Trudy for being here and modeling for me. I really appreciate it. And a shout out to Besame Cosmetics for sending me some era appropriate makeup to use at our tutorial today. So here we are with Trudy, all fresh faced and ready to go. The first step in a everyday makeup routine would have of course been skincare and providing a beautiful base for your makeup. People did use foundation back then, or they could also use, and or they could use something called vanishing cream, which provided a nice base for the makeup. This is a vanishing cream from Besame. They just came out with this beautiful skincare that is based on the skincare that would have been used back in the day. So we're gonna go ahead and use some of this on Trudy. Mmm, mm. smells lovely. Mm. Mm. So this was moisturizer and primer, basically. So we're just gonna massage this into the face. It should feel really nice and relaxing. Skincare is self-care. Mm. <laughs> Divine. Good. So this is really about, you know, giving a nice base to the skin. I think some women would have been using foundation back then, but I think the vast majority of the time it just would have been moisturizer, vanishing cream, and some powder, and that's what we're gonna do for this look. How does this compare to cold cream? Cold cream would have been used for cleansing, um, and that is part of Besame's line. So that's to take off the makeup, and there's always Pons. Pons is still around. Uh, you can get it at pretty much any drugstore, yeah, which cap. is the blue cap, you know? Mm -hmm. It's been around forever and ever for a reason, and um, yeah, that's also a great thing. I actually only learned that recently, is you know, the cold cream is for cleansing, and the, the vanishing cream is more for the primer and that kind of stuff. I feel less ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> There really is so much to learn. I, I, you know, I kind of, I taught this class at, I've been teaching vintage makeup for a few years now and I, you know, I always do research every time I do something new and it's like, I'll, I'll, you know, think the silly thing like, oh, I kind of, I know what it's about and then I'll do more research and be like, oh my God, I didn't know anything. And I think it's always important to keep learning and, um, and ne never stop learning. It's, it's always fascinating. I always learn something new and that's one of my favorite parts about teaching and doing these videos is just the chance to really get in there and just learn something new. So the next step is blush. Blush was one of those things that was expected um, to be imperceptible. So it was one of those things you could wear it, but you shouldn't really see it. Um, and it was part of that keeping yourself looking fresh and vibrant and like a lady and you know not like a slob. Um, I think one of my favorite, favorite lines uh, that I read during my research for this was, if he loves you, he remembers you even prettier than you are. So while he's away, keep the fences mended. Make sure he comes back to the face of his dreams. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, I know, no right? Pressure. <laughs> no pressure, ladies. Um, so it really, really everything is feeding into that whole idea of beauty is patriotic duty. You know, we know, ladies, that you're taking on all of these new roles. You're working in jobs you've never worked in before. You're doing all these things, but we still expect you to look good. And another of my absolute favorites that I saw, it was a, a video for um, women in the army about how to do their hair and makeup and their grooming. And one of the lines was, it's this girl sitting down at a table and a bunch of servicemen coming around to sit by her and talk to her. And it is, um, men are simple creatures. It gives them a lift to seeing a girl looking her most attractive. <laughs> like, wow, nailed it. Um, <laughs> I'll never think of lift in the same uh, way. It's right? Just... <laughs> it's, it's just... Mwah, so good. Glamour Days has some really, really good videos that you should definitely check out if you want to see makeup being done at that time, what women were being told at that time, which is, of course, always the best, the best research you can do. Um, so we're going to keep on going with our blush here. Uh, cream blush was, would have been used after the vanishing cream, but before the powder. Um, so we're just going to do a little... Whoop. This is uh, Lilium Blush by Stila. Always a really... The, the convertible color is always just a really nice formula that you can use on the cheeks or the eyes. I'm just gonna blend that in lightly. In quite a few of the videos, it was all about, you know, make it as imperceptible as possible. 
Now, I might be mistaken, but mm -hmm. there wasn't such thing, or I should say it was more cookie cutter as far as placement and stuff like that, wasn't it? For blush? Yes. That's actually a really interesting question because in a lot of the books, especially when you go into like the Westmore books and things like that, they talk about blush placement in this like super mathematical way. Hmm. And it was all about trying to get back to that to that oval face, the oval face being the perfect face, the, the face we're all supposed to want. Um, so it was like they, they go into the, you know, if your face is, is circle, you put it here to make your face look thinner. If your face is long, you put it on the, on the apples of your cheeks. Um, but the, the default was always just, you know, put it on the apples of your cheeks just to give yourself the most. And it was that dichotomy too between like trying to create this sculpting to your face, but using stuff that wasn't necessarily good for sculpting because you don't sculpt with blush. Right. That's not going to give you the right effect. Um, it's a contour that they were trying to achieve um, with not great products for that. But then I read another book that was was you know basically just like it literally was like just put your blush on like a normal human being you know <laughs> like just get over yourself you're not a you're not a painting in the Louvre just put it on your face which I really I appreciated that um that in that particular book that they were just being very straightforward about it so I think it it also comes back to the the makeup that we're doing now is much more of a natural look that women would have been doing every day and then we get more into the the makeup of, on screen that's when they got a little more into the you know the the extreme placement and stuff like that. So we have our very, very subtle blush. And next is the powder. The powder, again, when I was watching the Ern Westmore video, he, he really gets into the powder. And the powder, I think powder and lipstick were the two most important beauty tools back then, beauty products. So we're, I'm gonna go, again, use the lovely T. Leclerc powder in Camellia, which I've used a few times. It's just such pretty packaging and such a great neutral color. I think a telltale sign of how much powder they used mm -hmm. was, you know, I used to get air spun, right? Yes. And it's just yeah. like the tubs are massive. Yeah, they're you think massive. To, you think to yourself, I'm never going to go through this powder unless, unless that's how I use it. Right? Have you seen the video of Ern Westmore? Just like... There's this scene in Cover Girl. Oh, with right. Hayward, yes. Where she's like... She's just, they literally just like... <laughs> Oh yeah. my god. Oh my god. It's I will so never forget funny. It. It's just so, like throwing a bucket of powder yeah, onto her face. Exactly. I, I love that. So we're gonna go we're gonna we're gonna give Trudy a good powder. I'm not gonna go for the full uh cover girl or Westmore thing, but um I mean powder was a big deal for them. If they didn't use anything else, it would have been powder and lipstick, honestly. Kinda like what I do in a day to day actually. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I think we I think we definitely get this idea that um you know, 40s ladies were just walking around and, you know, full face every day. And that just really wasn't what was happening at the time. Because partly because it was this very interesting knife edge of, you know, you're expected to look good and, but not, not like you tried too hard. Mm -hmm. You know, that dichotomy that we all, that we still feel, I think, um, you know, look good, look lovely, look, have perfect skin. And yes, you can wear red lipstick, but don't look like you tried too hard past that. So it was that really that balance that they were trying to walk then and trying to walk now still, I think, to a certain extent. Absolutely. With the added, um, with the added pressure of, you know, are you doing your patriotic duty by, by keeping yourself looking good and keeping morale up for everyone and, you know, the men, you know, the, the boys across the sea fighting the war, you know, like it's, it's part, of, part of your duty as a woman. But that's why I think the amount of products that were available to everyday women are an easy way to just kind of tell how much time they were spending on themselves because mm -hmm. there wasn't a crazy amount of stuff that right. women had in their home arsenal. Right. And also going to work and setting their hair. Right. Must have taken enough time out of their day that their makeup was just kind of like a swab of this and a... Kind right, of, you know, pad of that. Yeah, and actually, I, I meant to add um, when I was applying the blush that there were a lot of home hacks going on because makeup was harder to get and the production was down. Cosmetics were not added to the list of restricted wartime industries, so they were actually allowed to keep producing makeup, which is pretty exceptional because it was considered necessary for morale and for patriotism. So that's how important the War Department, the War Department, thought makeup was. So you kind of get a sense of like. 
you know, just how important makeup was deemed for the war effort. Then they couldn't, there, there were restrictions on that to a certain extent because they couldn't use, um, they couldn't use uh, metal for a lot of the packaging and certain oils, castor oil was um, limited, things like that were limited. So it was harder to get and it was more expensive, but you could still get it. But along those lines, um, if it was, you couldn't get blush or you couldn't get lipstick, women would use beets, beetroot. You know how beets stain things, so they yeah. would use that, which is, I love that idea. Natural stain. Yeah. So Trudy's nice and powdered. I actually went, didn't go too crazy with the powder. I didn't do a, the full cover girl, but um, I'm going to go ahead and use this lovely brush from Besame, the face powdering brush that I was able to get from the last time we shot the, the, um, the 50s video, which I'm so very excited exciting. to use. I love this idea of powdering back then, where they, just, they put so much powder on and then just, you know, brush off the excess, which I think, I feel like nowadays, like, as a makeup artist I especially. Like a shoe. <laughs> <laughs> it feels so nice, right? actually. Yeah, I feel like nowadays we, when it comes to powder, we kind of, at least as a makeup artist, I'm always, I always put on like the absolute minimum amount. Like I, I hardly touch the face with powder and back then it was just a total opposite way to, to go about it. Do you know if this is a synthetic brush? Um, I believe it is a synthetic brush. I'm not, is that for me? I'm not 100% sure, but I think so. It feels really nice. But the synthetics, the synthetic brushes in the past few years have gotten so much better than they used to be. You used to always be able to tell, but now it's they're they're really good. But yeah, it's it's nice and soft and feels lovely. Ooh. So next we have cake mascara, which I've shown you in some other videos as well. And this is Besame again. So we're gonna tiny. use tiny this itty bitty brush with so a cake cute. mascara. Have you used cake mascara before? Uh, a long time ago. I can't say yeah. I have recently. So. Yeah, it's, it's a real, it's an interesting thing to use. <laughs> so I'm just hitting this with a little water to activate it. And you don't want to use too much water because you really want to think of the, you want to think about the texture of regular mascara, which is, you know, like a paste basically. So you want to create a paste. Okay, go back and forth here. So you get that going. I, and one of my favorite stories about spit ma about excuse me about mascara is that it's called spit cake because if they didn't have a chance or they didn't want to put water in it they'd spit in it and I remember hearing a story about this woman saying her grandmother had told her that if they knew the soldiers were coming into town you could hear all the girls spitting in their spit cake to get their mascara going I love very that story not very, very not COVID yeah do not do that <laughs> don't spit in your spit cake don't spit in your regular mascara <laughs> and another thing uh, speaking of home hacks was. Um, something that women would do if they couldn't get their hands on mascara uh, was they would take, they would burn cork and they would mix that, mix that with Vaseline and use that on the lashes. Which, very thrifty. Very thrifty. I can't imagine that staying really well, but who knows? I just think of mas I think of Vaseline as just really slipping everywhere, but um, maybe not. I don't know. And then they would also use the burnt cork in their eyebrows as well. Maybe something next, else I heard. Next video, we'll try all the homemade. Yeah, I think that might be a really fun video is to try the home hacks. It's funny. I think we've all been in this situation where we forgot our blush, so we're mm -hmm. using our lipstick. Yeah. And, you know, and it's just sometimes you learn... Absolutely. You know, you just kind of figure out what's necessary and what you can fudge because, and honestly, that's something that makeup artists do quite often is, you know, to us, everything is just pigment. So it doesn't matter if it's labeled an eyeshadow or a blush or whatever it is. It's like, it's just color. Where do you want the color to be? Um, so that's, that's something too. just, just in general, like don't get too hung up on what it's labeled as use it for what it's, you want it to be. Same go with brushes, you know, if, as a blush brush, but if you want to use it for, I don't know, bronzer or even eyeshadow, like do that. It's totally fine. And I think it's something to keep in mind too is that they didn't, they just didn't have the brushes back then that we have now, um, and they were totally 
different brushes too. So that's, I think when you're going for a truly authentic vintage look, it's important to remember that. Like they were using their fingers a lot more, even Ern Westmore in his, in this video, he has these big like sausage fingers and he's using, you know, he's using that to put the foundation on and everything. So they were definitely, they were definitely just using their fingers more. And just the formulas that they had back then, like they didn't have silicones back then. Um, I mean, after the 50s, they really ramped up production and R&D and things like that. But in the 30s and 40s and 20s, certainly, like they just they just did not have a, even close to what we have now. So Trudy is coming along nicely here. We have our mascara on, and I'm going to put the lipstick on. And just a quick word about brows. Brows were quite natural back then. Um, Trudy's brows are lovely, so I'm not going to play with them very much. Um, but it was it was not the brow of the 30s that super high arch overplucked the 50s it got a little more drama darker thicker higher arch the 40s it was really just leaning into that really much more natural brow um, so in a lot in most of the books it said like unless you're a blonde and you just don't have brows a, a blonde or a redhead like don't even don't even bother with your brows um, so that's something to think about and also I know this is this is going to look very natural but there wasn't a lot of eye makeup going on back then um, we're going to do a little bit more in the second video part two I watched two different tutorials online that were shot in the 40s, geared towards younger girls and then towards army ladies, and they didn't even put mascara on. So I just wanted to show like this look with mascara. So this might seem very minimal, but this was in fact like what a, what a lady probably would have been wearing at the time. So next up is lipstick, which is by far the most important the most important cosmetic of the 40s, for sure. It was important because it, you were kind of, it gave an exclamation point to your look. It showed that you were taking care of yourself. And, and it was a, a sense of, really brought home that sense of patriotic duty. There were all kinds of, lots of brands. I think almost every brand, in fact, came out with a lipstick that was, that had patriotic names. So on duty, off duty, fighting red, victory red, which is the one I'm holding from Bessemer right now. And um, Honor Bright, Auxiliary Red, Regimental Red, and my personal favorite, Homefront Ammunition. Um, <laughs> those were all names of reds that were around. And um, there was also, also Elizabeth Arden and um, Cyclox of London, and I, I think some other brands as well came out with um, little kits that, um, that included lipstick that, service, that were geared towards service women that they could put in their pocket. Um, mm -hmm. and it was like, you know. Foundation cream, vanishing cream, lipstick, a comb, a brush, and all these little basics that you could have. And so some service women were given reds to wear with their with their uniforms as well. There was a brand. There was something called Montezuma Red that was made specifically for marine women, marine women's uniforms to match the red um, in their uniforms because if it didn't match, they weren't allowed to wear lipstick. So it was very you, you could wear lipstick, but it had to match. It had to be appropriate with your uniform. Very military. Very military. Yeah, very military. Um, so that's, I think, I just love that idea of, you know, like it all coming together. So, you know, looking put together, playing the part, but not looking too made up. And also, I love this tidbit as well, is that Hitler supposedly hated makeup, but he especially hated red lipstick. So wearing red lipstick was a way to say, I hate Screw Hitler. You, Hitler. Exactly. I hate Hitler and the Nazis. So I think that's just, I love that idea of that whole, you know, performative aspect of it saying something while not saying anything at all. <laughs> Reason number 1,372, white <laughs> yeah. red lipstick. It's awesome. It's yes. Okay. And I'm actually going to put this on with a brush. Brushes in most of the, um, were actually a pretty common way to put on lipstick back then. Of course, women would put them on with a bullet, without a doubt, but lip brushes were around, and they were actually marketed um, during the war to get the most out of your lipstick, because we've all been there where it's like, you know, you have your little bit of your favorite lipstick and you can't get it the, the, the last little bit and you want to. And that was this was a way to extend the life of your lipstick because there's actually a lot down there. So this is actually still a really good trick to use. Um, so yeah, it's uh, something to think about. So as I said, this is um, Besame Victory Red. They were kind enough to send this to me. This is based off Victory Red from 1941. And I think this will just be a great way just to make, make everything pop. And a uh, thing about lip shapes is... Yes, the 40s is famous for that cut, the start of like the overdrawn lip. Of course, Joan Crawford was leaning heavily into that. Um, I think most ladies were just following their natural lip line, maybe overlining a little bit, but most ladies would not have been walking around with a full 
a full Joan Crawford smear. Um, I'm going to be following Trudy's natural lip line right now. Of course, Trudy has beautiful full lips, so this is very easy. Um, I will be doing a, I will go slightly outside of her lip line for the more glamorous look, but I really want to stick to a more, a more home front look for this. Almost entirely when you're doing a 40s look, it's a matte lip, it's a matte look. Um, so if you really want a, a true 40s look, you should stick to matte. There is a tiny bit of kind of almost a satin shine on this, but we're gonna go ahead and blot that to take away any shine. And if you ever wanna make a look, make a vintage look more up to date, adding, adding shine is always a good way to do that. So they were all very much about blotting the lips because we don't want any unladylike, <laughs> unladylike lip marks on anything. So go ahead and blot that. It's also a good way to get your lipstick to last a little bit longer. Blot it and then I'm gonna do another layer and then blot again. So we have a nice, some two nice thin layers. And I believe I've said this in a few other videos, but red lips, give yourself a minute. You want symmetry with your red lips. Most people's lips are, tend to be fuller on one side than the other, so it's fine if it takes you five or 10 minutes to put on red lipstick and get it to a point that you're happy with. Don't feel like you just have to magically slap it on and it's gonna look perfect. You have perfectly symmetrical lips and it, you do that, that is awesome, but don't feel like you have to. Lips are actually one of the more challenging things to do, especially on someone else. So I think people kind of have this concept of, you know, winged liner should just magically go on and lipstick, red lipstick should just magically go on, but that's not the case. Cut yourself a break, give yourself a little time to do it right. It's totally fine. And worth it. And worth it, yes. And also, playing with your lip line can really change your whole look. Like if you make your lips dramatically, if you make your lip pointier or rounder, or I mean, even just the tiniest bit of millimeter difference can change your entire look, your entire face. So give, your, give yourself play with that. I mean, just have fun with that. I remember the first time I really discovered that, it was like, ooh, <laughs> what am I, I going to do today? <laughs> By mistake sometimes. Right? Yeah. So this is our final 40s home front military look. We have vanishing cream, a cream blush, powder, a natural brow, mascara, and of course, red lipstick. And I think, Trudy, you look beautiful. I think you look ready to serve in the army or, you know, serve in a factory or anything like that. And thank you so much for being here. This was really, really fun. And I hope you thank enjoyed yourself. You. <laughs> so stay tuned. I'm going to be back in just a bit. And we are going to make Trudy into a glamorous Hollywood queen. So stay tuned for that. And if you haven't already subscribed, please do so below. And follow us on Instagram for more regular updates at My Vintage Love Blog. And we will see you at the next one. Bye.